All right. So this uh, interview, this conversation with my friend Josh has been a long time coming. Uh, we've known each other for a few years now, and we've discussed a few different times having a, a talk or conversation about some of the uh, insights, changes that he's experienced. Um, and I guess I'll just start with uh, asking you, or maybe we can remind ourselves, we met maybe, like I said, a few years ago, and I think you came to my house and we had a weekend retreat or a one-day like session of sitting. Um, before that, had you had any significant sort of spiritual interest or interest in awakening or anything along those lines? Uh, I definitely had some interest in all sorts of spiritual things, but never had an experience like I did while I was sitting in your basement. Hmm. Can you describe that? Yeah. So I remember the first meditation was somewhat guided and I, I don't know, maybe I should actually start from the beginning. Um, sure. I didn't really have any expectations upon coming to your place. I just kind of had gotten an invitation and I remember I showed up at the door and you were so friendly and I got to meet everyone around and I just wasn't in a place where I was like, Oh, this is going to be this, or it's going to be this. I was kind of, I was pretty open coming into the experience. And so anyway, I remember sitting there during the guided meditation aspect and there was this point where I lost all sense of self, like couldn't feel my body, my hands felt like they had swollen to about the size of the entire house. They just, that was one of the most interesting feelings that kind of triggered it. And um, then I started experiencing this feeling of, of traveling at the speed of light or something like that. And it felt like I was heading toward the center of something, center of the universe. Mm. And it was just kaleidoscope of colors and lack of physical sensation in my body, but more like sensing everything simultaneously. Hmm. I was no longer me. Had uh, you ever experienced anything like that before? No, nothing like that. No. Hmm. And I remember even after we took that first break, okay, that was, you know, we were on silence, right? And so we were just kind of upstairs, just kind of meandering around and I was drinking some water and I remember in your backyard, there were some cattails and I could see these red winged blackbirds out there. And there was this very distinct, like vibration and glow coming from that location in your yard. It was just like this reverberation. And I was like, okay, all right. Not judging the experience, not attempting to change it. Um, and just kind of holding, not even holding on to it. That would be a little bit of a, it wouldn't be the proper way to put it more just like settling into it and allowing it. And then the second round we went in, it wasn't guided. And then at that point it, it kind of expanded even more. I felt like I was in a room and then that room was boundless all of a sudden. And it kind of began like at this point in my head and it felt like there was like a blossoming here and all of a sudden I can feel everyone else that was in that room with us I could feel their breath like it was just this I was we were almost like breathing simultaneously is what it felt like and um anyway mm. <laughs> I could talk about it forever because it's still so visceral for me and I've had experiences mm -hmm. similar to that since Mm -hmm. Was there anything, you know, what, one thing that strikes me as remarkable in this, and it probably would strike someone else watching it, I, I would imagine, is how natural, uh, it may not have felt, um, it was obviously unexpected, and yet somehow you, you had a naturalness about it. Uh, you, from what you're describing, it didn't sound like you're afraid or going, cool, 
It was more just like complete acceptance of it, like it was an old friend. That's how I'm hearing what you're saying, which is quite remarkable considering you've never experienced anything like that. Yeah, and that's a great way to put it. it there's, you know, I think we've had conversations since where it was more of a feeling of remembering or like you said, an old friend, it's something that's always been present is what it felt like. Mm -hmm. It wasn't foreign. Yeah. It didn't feel like it was triggered by some kind of substance. It it's always been yeah. like right next to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, leaving, leaving that day or that, that re the retreat we had, do you remember sort of after effects? Did it just kind of disappear and, and you didn't think much about it? Or were you having like significant experiences beyond that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, that weekend I had a camping trip planned with a friend. And so we went down to the Mount Hermon wilderness, which is just north of Colorado Springs up in the mountains. And I just remember feeling so intensely connected to everything, nature, but also other people and then inanimate objects. I remember even driving down there, I could feel when a car wanted to merge before it merged. But I'm not saying I had a sense of the future. It, it was just a sense of no time. There is no past, mm -hmm. present, future. The flow is kind of all encompassing is what it was like. And on the yeah. way back, I left the Colorado Springs area and all the way home, it was nothing but green lights. I didn't hit the brake, but once to slow down to get out on the off ramp. And I never had that experience before because I lived in the heart of Denver. And I, and I remember feeling how natural that felt as well, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Also, while driving, it didn't feel as if I was moving through time and space, but it felt like time and space was moving past me. And then on the way into my apartment, there was this... Um, guy who I've seen around town and he clearly speaks to people that aren't there and he shouted across the street, Hey, do you want to buy one of my pictures? And I was like, sure. You know, I was in this place of yes, yes, yes. Right. And he, I'm like, how much? He's two bucks. I give him $2 and he hands me a marker drawn picture of almost an exact replica of what I was experiencing during my meditation. And I remember he looked at me and I looked at him and it wasn't even like the what, but it was more like, Oh yeah, I know you, <laughs> you know, it was of so course, cool. Right. Of course. And of then course you handed me this picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was so vivid. And there were so many images and symbols in that picture. I was just like, this is, this is a beautiful, you know? Um, and then mm -hmm. right around my birthday, which was a couple months after that, I was sitting on my couch and there was a lot of people around and it, I guess externally, it seemed like a lot of chaos, people talking and moving around. And I suddenly had this feeling that I was watching myself. And I, so I just allowed myself to kind of just relax into it. I'm seeing a lot of swirling colors. The walls have... A, a vibration, they look fluid. And all of a sudden I'm watching myself from a distance and I have this overwhelming urge to laugh and I'm laughing, but it's, it's all internally. I'm not physically laughing and I'm just laughing. And it's like that joy of when I was a little kid and you'd have one of those moments where you'd say the same thing at the same time as a best friend, you know, the jinx moment. And it just brought like so much joy. Oh, so we're synchronized or I don't know what it is, but it makes you laugh even harder. And that was just like filling me up. And, um, there, there was just a single thought up, upon kind of coming back into my body is that, you know, the whole point of everything is to play. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what is really settled with me, you know, and I haven't even treated it as a dogma, but it just keeps coming back as a truth. Mm. You know, kind of a natural, yeah, this is, this is what it is. Yeah. I remember distinctly, I even remember where I was standing when I was reading the text from you. Uh, and you started, we had been messaging back and forth, uh, like, I don't know, every few days or something, sort of 
talking a little bit about maybe non-duality or so. I don't even remember what we were talking about. But then you started messaging me, everything is play. And I, I kind of was like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden I just read it a little differently. Like, wait, I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I started asking you questions about what your, ex how your experience of self is or your experience of whatever. I don't even remember what I was asking, but I was, I could tell there was a significant identity ch change, um, dissolution, really. Uh, and then, then I, I felt it like I felt like I was just there with you. And, um, that was obvious to me at that, that, that moment. And you were so blown out in a way, like you're, you kind of always are like that ever since it, there's not, I don't, I don't sense there's much of, of a self-reflection going on going, Oh yeah, I had an awakening or anything like that, but it was damn obvious to me. Um, and I loved that you said that everything is play. The other thing I want to say about this for anyone who listens to this and, ask themselves, well, how do you sit down for the first round of a meditation in a place you've never been with no expectations, with no real sort of, I don't know, practice history and have something like this happen? Um, and I, I don't know if I know the answer. Some of it's probably karmic, some of it's conditions and so forth. But I will tell you one thing, um, anyone who watches this, uh, about you, about Josh, and that is <clears throat> when I met you, I was completely struck before before – we meditated at all when you came to my house. I was completely struck by one thing, um, and it was how completely authentic you were, completely authentic. Everyone you were talking to, you were just very present with people, but there was just no BS about you, uh, and that stands out to me big time. If you take a one, if you take a hundred people and, and stand them in order of who's the most authentic, you would be like number one just in that in that way because it stuck out to me, and I remember you being extremely emotionally articulate and emotionally healthy and not afraid to talk about like what was going on emotionally with yourself or others in the room. And it was totally casual too. This wasn't like we we're having some purposeful, deep circling experience. It was just obvious about you. So this is something I noticed. And, and when, when this shift happened so quickly for you and just kept kind of just deepening into itself and seemed so effortless, I would, I would venture to say, and I've kind of touched on this with you before, that there was a lot of work that actually came before that, specifically in the emotion spectrum and in the authenticity spectrum. Um, and I think that does really set people up for this. Not only that, once you've had an awakening, it makes things go a lot smoother, a lot less struggling against the process. And notably, you, you're describing this so well that you, you weren't struggling against it at all. It felt completely natural. Um, and... And I think, yeah, so, so that's, that's the kind of message I would sort of give to anyone watching this and going, how in the hell does this happen like that quickly? And um, there's probably a lot that went on before, beforehand that may not have been directly related to awakening insight, but it was definitely related to a, a thoroughgoing authenticity internally um, and emotional clarity, which um, was striking to me. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um... I guess there was a point in my uh, emotional growth or spiritual growth where I, I started learning how to choose. And I guess what that means for me is simply whatever feels most authentic, and it's usually the first thing that comes, is what I choose. It wasn't easy to get there. You know, there's a lot of that double talk and the stuff that goes on in our heads, yet there was there was a moment in my twenties where that became kind of a way of life, mm. you know, and I've, I've had conversations with other people and it's, there's, there seems to be like an envy that arises from some people. And the first thing I always say to them is like, there's, there's nothing that I have that you're lacking at all. You yeah. are already awake you just need to remember, you know, and it might not even mean work for you. Maybe you've deluded yourself to thinking you have to put in some work and work hard to get there. Maybe it's more about removing layers, you know, and yeah. Yeah. I, I can see there's the head gets in, in the way. And I'm a cerebral guy, too. I like to read about, uh, you know, quantum physics and I love science. And we've had those conversations before as well. Um, yet I think I have somehow taught myself over time how to shut it off. 
or mm-hmm. let it let it just speak in the background without influencing what I'm doing currently. So yeah. I don't <laughs> I wish I knew and I can <laughs> No, I could resonate with that very much so the the intellect I mean I have intellectual interest in a lot of things but what's so strange and interesting and I see it as sometimes a um a uh, challenge for people is I don't apply it to spirituality, strangely. I've never been obsessive about reading old texts or looking up definitions of emptiness. Or I did not want to do that. I wanted to live it. That was it. I don't, I did, and I didn't care if that meant Angela had to die. <laughs> Even the body, had to, yep. I didn't care. It was, I had to live it, and that's it. Now, that's the strange thing is the mind can be very, very effective and, and powerful and in a lot of things, in a lot of areas, communication, uh, planning, all these things. When it comes to this... It's the opposite. It's about a, a surrender. Uh, and I really want to touch into the play thing. Right? Can, maybe you can unpack that a little bit. What do you mean by play? When you say everything is play, what does that mean to you? How does that play out in your life? Or how is it playing out now? I think, well, th- this is a perfect transition from what you just said, too. Because when you said you didn't care if you had to die... I had that distinct experience as well, um, where it was this moment where it was almost like that temptation to swallow if you if you have that urge, you know, and it was like this feeling that I might be falling, like am I losing my mind sensation, and instead of resisting that, which is I think very natural, I allowed myself to fall and in a way it felt like a death. Like I fell out of whatever I thought I was, you know, and it kind of opened things up. I, I feel like we, we tend to get really attached to identity throughout our lives, you know, and it puts on blinders and by allowing myself to feel like it's okay to die, those layers peeled back quite a bit. Mm. And that's where the play comes in is that I think we, or I have taken my existence very seriously in the past. So many things I placed meaning upon this means something and it means something terrible or this means something and it means something amazing. And so the play is you get to kind of decide what your experience is. And it's not so damn serious. You know, (laughs) once we stop taking ourselves so seriously, it's beautiful. There's so much more out there Mm -hmm. and you can play with it. And then you get to choose your game, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Some people are competitive and that's their game. Some people, you know, think life's all about working hard, all these things. But I think once we settle into the fact that this is a choice I make, of the way I want to exist, then you can realize it's a game. And if it's a game, you can decide to play another game. You can change the rules. And I'm not even saying this in a, like, uh, I don't know, rebellious manner. It's more like there's so much going on around us uh, that we choose not to perceive that if I allow Mm -hmm. myself to play the game of just, I'm open to everything that comes amazing things. It's just, the world is completely magic. You know, there's Mm -hmm. really no limitations. And I'm not saying I've walked through walls, although I can totally see how it's possible because I've seen them move. I've seen them move without being on any substance. And I'm like, this is actually fluid. All solid things are just vibrational, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's a game. Mm Mm-hmm. And laughter is a really good trigger for a lot of people because it's a surrender. There's a vulnerability there. And I've seen it. I've Mm -hmm. seen when people are laughing, they, they let down some guards, you know? And so I'm like, play a game that makes you laugh, that brings whatever joy is. But also my relationship between happiness and joy has shifted entirely. I don't see them as the same Mm -hmm. thing anymore. I see happiness as something that I pursue and I have to work for. But joy is ever present and I'd rather experience joy. (laughs) I love it. I love it. There's so so many things I I could, 
ask you here um, or have you unpack for people. And one is, what if somebody listening, to, so man, taking, taking ourselves too seriously, that may just be it, right? That may be, if, if you could just find a way to stop doing that, that may collapse so much of our identity. Um, why do you think we take ourselves so seriously? What's the tendency? What's the hmm. belief? That's a good question. I see it as it's kind of an avoidance of suffering or fear, maybe. Like the idea of tribalism or really anchoring into some kind of identity. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people that are really firm in an identity, but it's one of those external identities, if you will. And as you speak to them, you start to see some variation and in, in, in like more honest, vulnerable spilling out of that box that they want to apply themselves to. But I think up, upon like losing identity, it feels like you lose everything. So whatever we are attached to with identity, it's like, this is all I have. And I guess, I guess the whole point is to say, or let people know that there's, there's more to you beyond your identity. This is just who you think you are, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, there's this question I, mm -hmm. I started having people uh, ask themselves, I teach acting and ask yourself, how am I not myself? And that starts to like mess with people's heads because I don't know how I'm not myself, but I think we actually do. That's like that friend <laughs> that has always been there with us, you know, and um, we just didn't perceive of it. So that's why that experience felt so familiar because I think it was always there. Mm. You know, I left my body. I, I left love everything. That you know, because there I am. There is no me. You know, this is, this is, I love, I love the, the question is so powerful. Yeah. Well, I got that from the movie, I heart Huckabees, uh, which I had watched yeah. a long time ago, early two thousands, you know, <clears throat> and then it really <clears throat> resonated with me. Oh, I'm starting to get the question now, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, I think that's I, I, why we take ourselves so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You've, we've talked about acting a little bit in the past, and it it really interests me. Improv interests me. Acting interests me. And you mentioned at some point this idea of confronting the character, confronting a character when you're, say, learning a new role, learning a new character, like the method and so forth. And I, and you, when, when you told me about this, which I didn't know much about at all, uh, you you very specifically emphasized confronting the confronting part. Uh, and I loved what you said about it, although I can't really remember. Can you talk about that a little bit and how that might apply to confronting identity? Yeah. So uh, oftentimes when you dig into a character, you need to understand what their limits are. And that's part of that confrontation. So people who are really good at acting and it really apply themselves to the method, they become that character. And in that process, you have to confront certain things about yourself that you might not like. Am I capable of severely harming another person? Am I, you know, what are my capabilities here? And how does that apply to my character? Um, you know, some of the best actors, they're really capable of almost shifting a personality in that way. But I think within discovering a character and understanding those limits, you have to know yourself very thoroughly too. Because if you don't know how you would approach this, if this was your circumstance, then it's going to be difficult to find that within that character. And so I think the yeah. authenticity that you talk about and the honesty is paired with a third principle or value that a lot of people don't often think about it, and that's courage. Um, mm -hmm. It's courage to see yourself as you truly are versus in your best lights or your worst lights. And that's part of that confrontation. How malleable 
is this character, how malleable am I? Am I fixed? Am I flexible? You know, how am I not myself? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's the same thing when we confront ourselves. You know, have I done things that I haven't been proud of in the past? Yeah. Getting honest with that is really healthy, I think. You know, and being able to yeah. tell other people those things. There's there's value there. Yeah. You know, so uh, one of the things you said brought back this memory for me. It's an aspect of what uh, what it was like in the sort of rubble after awakening for me when I was 24. It happened so fast and it was so, in a sense, devastating, but in another sense, just absolutely completely freeing that I kind of forgot a lot of it in a way. But, but it, sometimes these conversations bring back certain parts of it. And now I think it's integrated, but it's been a slower process, so it's a little harder to recognize it through the contrast. However, I remember very distinctly after this shift, uh, maybe within a, a week after I noticed, I felt like I was playing – it wasn't like I don't want to say I was playing roles because it was it wasn't like an additional layer of acting on top of anything. It was like because the layer of what I thought I was was turn, turned out to actually be a role, and it wasn't true. When that was gone, I noticed myself fluidly changing all the time. I could be anything. I could be both sides of something. I could change how I interacted with people in a moment, like just instantaneously without thinking about it. And it was happening all the time. And I was like, "What in the world is this?" And it felt so good. It felt so good because it was something that wasn't there. It was something I was freed from, freed from the illusion of my own identity. Uh, and it was like pl play. It was like play. And it yeah. was so much fun. And it was so s silly. And it didn't matter. You know, it but sounds like improv. It also, it was like improv, but I was doing it all the time. It was really interesting. Right. It was a and natural way of being. It was also like, yeah, it was also deeply authentic, even though it could sound like, your, if, you're, if your identity is fluid or your, what appears as your identity is fluid, it could almost sound like you're making it up as you go or something, but it wasn't. It was so authentic because it was energetically, energetically appropriate. It, it was, there was a synchronicity to it that was so obvious. Um, I could be a rock. I could be the sky. I could be happy, sad. I could be angry, frustrated, open, empty, just on and on and on and on and on. And that's what it felt like. And what was also interesting is it had a way of sort of, inducing it in other people for a while back totally um, it does rub off mm -hmm. yeah well because it's yeah. it's interesting people see something in that that's that's what i mean by the envy and and i don't mean it like this deep dark envy but it's just like i how can you mm -hmm. be this way how can you do these things i wish i could mm -hmm. and my first response is you you can <laughs> you are these things <laughs> exactly you know you what are, I mean? Yeah. But yeah. it's, I think people see that kind of freedom and it. it's definitely something that's attractive, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because. Yeah, I've observed the same thing with famous, specifically actors and actresses and perhaps musicians, that there's that kind of almost like a widespread, a bit of envy. But I, I don't think people look at them and go, I wish I had the life they had necessarily. It's more like, I wish I just could give myself permission to act that vulnerably directly yeah. honestly yeah i see that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so how did all this change uh your your interactions with people your interactions with your vocation and all that well you know one thing i will say is i'm my my judgment machine something that i used to have you know, I felt like it was part of what I was doing for a living is I had to be discerning of every single thing that I saw in front of me is, is less of a judgment machine and more of a noticing thing. So hmm. I don't feel as judgmental toward other people's behavior. It's more like, oh, you know, this is just where they're at or this is what's going on with them versus this. I guess there was this need to want to maybe it was probably control a need to change behaviors and interactions. Um, so that, that definitely showed up where I just 
kind of saw people as how they showed up and allowed it. Um, I also can, I feel like I can see people a lot more clearer than I used to be able to, like there's insight. So when you were talking about that authentic free flowing, you could be a rock, the sky, happy, sad, all those things. I think there's that honesty within all of us. And I see it a lot more clearer than I used to, you know, like it just, it's almost instantaneous. You can just, it's that namaste, you know, you recognize it almost right away, you know? Yeah. Um, there was a time right after the awakening where I felt like I had some kind of responsibility and I, this might be that rubber banding that we kind of talk about that I have to help people, you know, I have to get mm -hmm. them here. And I ran into a lot of, uh, walls with that because I think I felt like there was this desperate need to get everybody to like experience what I had experienced. And once I kind of started letting that go, um, things flowed a lot better with other people. But for a while I felt almost like, uh, I was isolated a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can relate to that for sure. And especially coming from you, I would say, you know, that's largely compassion. It's genuine with just a little bit of control hidden in there, you know, yeah, a little bit of like, is. I want you to wake up because I don't want to feel what you're feeling and repressing it, you know? Um, but it's also par for the course. I mean, why would you not want people you love to, to feel free themselves, you know, and all that. But it's totally. interesting how for me, it took a long time, especially with my family to really let go of even the hidden ideas that I had that, Somehow, somehow I should wake up enough at some point to help them, you know, uh, and it was, it was just seen so clearly at some point that it's, it's completely okay either way for everyone. And, and I don't decide this stuff. It's not like that. Um, I can, I can be available. I can facilitate if someone's interested in waking up, they have my attention, um, and they want to work at it or whatever. But, uh, but there's certainly no agenda about it. And I can also relate to what you said about noticing instead of judging and reacting, it's more like just noticing. Oh, okay. And that that's equanimity work for the, for you, for, for me, for the practitioner, um, of just really being willing to feel the discomfort of not giving yourself the illusion of control in certain situations. I'm not going to say being in control because you never really were not in the way you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no. And so, so it's a matter of like being willing to feel, and there's going to be some discomfort with that because, we've re built a reactive self out of avoiding certain discomforts, you know, fear of deeply rooted fears of helplessness and loss of validation, um, shame, and things like I that. I think that that's what a lot of people are avoiding. With. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, but I think that's one of the reasons people don't want to take or struggle with taking the step of kind of removing the layers of identity is it's mm -hmm. surrounded by a lot of fear and pain often, you know, mm -hmm. and what I naturally understood in that process is I had to experience that also while I was removing those layers. At least that's just what I, that's just what came and I accepted it. And, yeah. you know, for the longest time I was experiencing every emotion every day. So I was experiencing the joys and lows, and it was just like a huge spectrum of emotion every day. Now mm -hmm. I, I do experience those things, but they don't, they're not as heavy as they were initially. You know, they're still there. Mm -hmm. They haven't disappeared. I've just allowed them more, mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> yeah. What would you say to go back just a bit to where you were talking about play? Um, and, and perhaps I think you said this, this whole deal we're talking about could, could be a matter of letting go of being too serious, taking yourself too seriously, taking life too seriously, and just allowing yourself to play, for instance. What would you say to somebody who really has an ingrained idea about working hard at spirituality? Working, because it's a, not everybody has this fixation, but it's it's a reasonably common one. And yeah. certain mindsets definitely hold on to that. Definitely. Um, you know, it, it, I've met a lot of people that are kind of 
you know, retreat addicts. And I think a lot of people might have a sense that what they're, they're looking for something on, on an external, if I'm in the right environment or I do these certain things, then it'll come. And it's almost, I guess the way I would tell or ex ex express myself about it is less is more, you know, it's, it's like when I came into your basement and had that experience, I didn't have anything that I expected to find, you know, I mean, it could have turned out to just me being there with my eyes closed with nothing the entire time, but it, it wasn't. So I guess when it comes to play, it's almost like there is a risk with play, right? It, it, it's similar to work. Anything that we do, there can be, potential consequences that we don't like, but it's, it's allowing yourself to be as present as possible in the midst of that play, you know? And so people that are really working hard on the spirituality don't look for the payoff, you know, allow yourself to just play because when you play, you don't know where that game's going to go most of the time. You know, I remember when I was a kid, we would just play and we would end up miles away from home doing all sorts of things because it would just flow on its own. So I guess yeah. it would be the same thing is, you know, don't get too stuck on what you think it should be and it will come to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I really love to try to encourage people to, you know, maybe tune into these things we talk about experientially, emotionally or instinctually. But then forget about the story because it just won't be your story. It's everybody wakes up in the life they're in. And what's so funny is you wake up when, however it happens, there's suddenly not resistance to life. Uh, there's not resistance to the internal and external experience. Um, and it's just seen how clearly and simply life moves um, and, and joyously. But it's this, again, the joy without an opposite. There's a joy in equanimity and there's a, do there's a joy in deep trust. And deep trust has to come with vulnerability. They just, you can't really separate those out. Yeah. Um, yeah. The play, and you mentioned that the, there could be a, potential drawback to the, to play um i might say like yeah if you if you turn anything into a doctrine or a dogma you're somehow your ego is probably going to get a hold of it but i might say if if you have an avoidant personality if you tend to avoid responsibility avo avoid things in life and look for things to help you avoid that might not be the doctrine for you or at least um make sure you establish good boundaries first and you're taking care of responsibilities and, and clear seeing and all that. Um, but boy, I know exactly what you mean by it. When you were speaking, I actually picked up this, this sense that when you're talking about play, uh, maybe what you're talking about actually is the opposite of, uh, resistance. Yeah. The, yeah. It's, um, come what may it, it's living, in improv, you know? Yeah. If I say orange, the first thing that comes to your mind, there's no right or wrong. And I think that's the part of play where it, there's no judgment. And when I say the potential consequence, I guess what I mean is I think some people have like a hang up. Like if, if I enter into this, something terrible could happen. And it's more mm -hmm. like going, I don't care. Cause this is what it's all about. Um, mm -hmm. but you're right. I think certain personalities might hear that and, and parse it differently. Um, it's not, you know, I think in our culture, things are very destination oriented and this really is journey oriented. This, this experience I've had where it's not about where it's headed. It's not even about what now 
it's just kind of every day allowing it to be. I don't know if there's something next. And to be honest, I don't care. And that's why it works. Because if I cared, you know, that's, it's a, it's a, I know it doesn't make a ton of sense, but that's how it is. I've had a lot of conversations it sense, with but you. It feels where, exactly right. Yeah. Where we've devolved into, well, what's the point of talking? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we're just sending emojis to each other at a certain point because that's kind of <laughs> ultimately where it comes, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there is a, there is a courage to play I've noticed with people. And mm-hmm. I think that, um, that's what I mean by the potential consequences. You have to at least allow it and see what comes. Cause it's not nearly what you think, you know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you. It, when I do my home retreats, uh, and I've done it with a group retreat of about 30 people at a Silomar, one of the things I do often when it's a semi-silent retreat is in the evening we'll do like a couple hours of improv. And we oh, do cool. introductory type improv exercises and so <laughs> forth. I love it personally. I love improv. Um, some people are so natural at it. It's so much fun to watch. What, but what I will tell you is it's surprising that of all the things we do during retreat, that's the one that's the most triggering for some people. Like they are mm. terrified of it. Mm. Um, even when I say it's a group activity, we're all going to do it together. You know, it's a group presence, you know, a practice. And it, somehow it's like really, really terrifying to some people to the point where I'm like, I don't even know if I want to do it anymore because it just, some people are so like, it freaks them out. What's interesting is every, by the time they, they do it, Usually they're they're pretty much okay with it. Finally, when they see, but yeah. there's something in that fear of humiliation, probably you know, uh, fear of um, spontaneity, even right, fear of actually, God forbid, being spontaneous and going off of my script for an hour or two. But I love it, right? Because as yeah. you said, life really is improv. It is. It already is. You're already improvising a character. You just believe it. You forgot that you put the mask on. Yeah, it's true. You know. Yeah, and when people get kind of hung up in the I'm going to make a mistake, it's like there's this right or wrong answer with whatever we do. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not always going to get the results I want, yeah. but that's giving me the sense that I have control over the results anyway. But mm-hmm. allowing myself to say, I don't really have control and whatever the universe or experience or however you want to put it places right in front of me. If I'm open to it, I actually get to see it for what it truly is versus what I want it to be. Mm. And it's much more yeah, beautiful you know, when it's what it really is. Yeah. It, even, even if we feel into and accept in a sense that there's not really control, there can be a fear of, disappointment that it did just didn't, didn't go the way you expected even if you didn't feel like you had control but boy in reflection so many so many serendipitous events in life came so randomly when you didn't expect things to go the way they did or when you thought they were going to go this way and they go completely the other way and maybe you meet the right person at that point that that's going to be the catalyst for you who knows maybe you, who knows? I mean, there's so much, so much possibility in our limited mind that thinks it's so intelligent because it can c- create a model of the future. It's just a model. It's a, it's an idea. Right. It might be helpful for communication. It might be helpful to communicate with other people and make plans. Sure. But it doesn't mean it's like accurate, you know, the right. vast majority of the time. And, um, you know, I, I read something, this is a little bit of an aside, but I thought it was super fascinating. I was reading about something about sociology, and there's a sociologist, a professor of sociology, who he actually believes, and I think it's pretty accurate, that the sense of agency, the sense that I'm an active agent in my environment, I'm controlling things that go on in my environment, that that's not even a personal experience. It's actually a shared experience, and it's communal, that we we use it, we use that paradigm to communicate with one another and probably it helps us to plan things as groups, but it's not even a personal experience. Actually, it's not. It doesn't make. And and, and in some cultures, there's not really a strong sense of agency. It's more like um, uh, 
you might say primitive cultures or, or like indigenous cultures, they, they don't have, they don't think about time in the same way. It's not linear. It's circular, uh, cohesiveness and group experience is very much shared versus a sense of individuality. Um, and a lot, I think a lot of, a lot of our anxieties, depression, self doubt come from this illusion of individuality and illusion of agency. Totally. A misusing of it. Yeah. yeah. Along that, I read this article about consciousness and they're pretty certain all consciousness operates on a quantum level anyway, which mm. basically means that, yeah, we are having shared thoughts, shared experiences and shared feelings because we're all, you know, tapping in. We're all entangled mm -hmm. in some way. But mm -hmm. I think the further I've gone into this experience, yeah. I've even realize even further that everything is entangled. Everything is constantly entangled. There is no individuality. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I'm just a part of all that is, mm -hmm. you know, and then yeah. you, you start losing the eye there. I remember, I remember talking to you about this as well, maybe a couple of years after the first stuff that happened and I don't remember the exact details, but it was over a couple of days we were kind of messaging and you were describing how that final sense of I or individuality, it was just seen that it doesn't really exist. It couldn't exist and seemed to just stop functioning at some point, something like that, but I don't remember the details of it. Yeah, it, um, it was, it was kind of like playing with that duality of this feels very certain that I'm having this experience. And then that would trigger this like lack of self experience out of that. And then I would literally be watching myself from a distance and I'm like, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't exist in the way that I used to think anyway, you know, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm it, it, and it doesn't feel as lonely individualism leads to a lot of loneliness. You know, I feel interconnected with all things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. kind of like that, ex that experience is there's no more I, but I'm, I can still play the game where I'm here and I'm doing these things and that's the play, but it's not so serious where I have to hold on to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And one day, you know, this physical body will, will die but there won't be any suffering along with that for me. And, and it's interesting. My partner, her grandparents passed away this summer and they were both centenarians. And, you know, these, these are people from the Midwest and I got to watch, you know, her grandmother going through the process of she chose to pass away. She chose to die. And the m amount of peace that she was experiencing and desire to connect with other people and just being a part of all things when she made that choice for herself. Um, it, it felt like an awakening to me. Like, mm -hmm. I think we, I think we all get there and you, you have mm -hmm. to understand like her family history. I mean, she was depression, you know, I mean, during that period in time. And so there would be a lot of things to hold on and we know how people kind of follow those patterns, but she had let it all go and just became what she truly was. Mm. And um, I thought it was really beautiful. beautiful. I, I couldn't quite express it that way to my partner um, because, you know, she, obviously she was going through a lot of emotions, but I was able to be present for her in a way that I think she needed, you know, kind of a, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't adding or taking away from her experience in that process. Yeah. Yeah, my own father passed away about a year and a half ago, and I found the same thing, especially at the energetic level and the emotional level. I've never seen him so relaxed in a way and in wonder. He was co he was conscious, and uh, he was basically going into respiratory failure and kidney failure simultaneously. Uh, and we knew it was his life was going to end uh, in the next couple of days. But I remember him just staring like off, but but not. He wasn't, he wasn't, um, 
he wasn't like disoriented and he wasn't delu he wasn't uh, delirious he was very very present actually more than i've ever seen and i could see him even energetically letting go of us as he was still just just completely aware and awake uh, i thought it felt amazing and i felt grateful for him to go through this consciously um and it was so enjoyable and at the same time i was trying not to be too strange by going off the script of you know my you know my family's there grieving and stuff and but i'm like you're going to the great beyond like this yeah. is like just look <laughs> you know and he he just kind of smiled and kind of laughed you know and um, i thought it was amazing but i didn't want to get too weird about it um uh but yeah changing forms everything's already changing forms that's just a a way that it changes forms and such, such that what's what was never there is completely undeniable because you can't hold on to anything at that point you know it's right. so beautiful <laughs> what was never there what is never here what is never here <laughs> loudest thing in the room <laughs> let's play let's let's play well, okay so you you said uh, this thing and i wanted to ask you specifically about it because it may be helpful for someone to hear maybe not you said, um, I feel connected to everything. Is that a feeling like a, like a sensation or? Yeah, it's a physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental feeling. It's, it's all encompassing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I had a birthday a few days ago and I live really close to three sisters here in Evergreen and I went on a hike and I remember sitting on top of one of the sisters and just like, as I'm sitting there, there's no barrier between the air, the sky, myself and this rock is what it felt like there. There's like a harmonious and And if I really tap into it, it feels kind of like a body gasm would be the best way to describe it. It's like this mm -hmm. really comfortable vibration that moves throughout my body in different patterns you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just visual. It, it, it's, it, it feels like I am intimately intertwined with everything. Um, sometimes it's, you know, for me, it could be just sitting on the couch and allowing myself to be present. And then I notice a lot of visuals, you know, there's, it feels like there's threads of color and things moving around all the time. And it, I feel interconnected with that. It doesn't feel like that's outside of me and I'm experiencing that mm -hmm. it's part of who I am. It's really hard to describe, mm -hmm. you know, cause the more I get into using it, the I, I realize words don't work. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely not. But it's also fun to point in this way sometimes. So when you say part of me, um, is there a sense of you in all of that? Or is this just, there's no other way to talk about it? Yeah. So it's not part of me. That's just the easiest way to translate it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm that it's, mm -hmm. I am no, I, I'm not here, mm -hmm. but I'm experiencing this thing, but is it even, yeah. you know, it's not me. It's yeah. all things. Yeah. Um, and that's why like I got, I got to a point, I'm not afraid of the idea of death it doesn't scare me at all. Because I, mm -hmm. I kind of have settled that I'm I'm not even really here, <laughs> you know. I can't go anywhere because <laughs> you know it's all the same or intertwined. <sighs> it's hard to put into words. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's like really. I mean, it's essentially it, it is impossible, and yet somehow it can be pointed to to some degree. Um, also, would you say that the, like, say if you just notice an object across the room, like anything, a, a lamp or a poster or a wall, um, obviously there's a part of you that knows that you and I are going to agree that there's a wall there, that, that there's something there called a wall. That's an agreement or a, just a conventional way of speaking. But what is your experience of that object now? Is it so, an object? Is it in one place? I don't feel separate. Because I can actually, I can actually energetically, not, not physically, but it's almost like there's these tiny threads of color, like rainbow, but I'm talking atomically small that mm -hmm. there is no separation between this and that. 
even physically. Yep. And then if I allow myself to settle in that even more, I realize I'm not even in what I think my body is. And I'm somewhere mm -hmm. in between those two things as well. Mm -hmm. But not, you know, not as an identity necessarily, yeah. but just a, another waveform of energy. So it's, yeah. it's not really pointing at this and that, even though there is limitation to language, as you say, and, and we can point to things. Uh, it, it's just the easiest way to kind of put it that between me and this is there's infinite space and no space simultaneously. That's what it feels like. I'm actually interconnected with that, but I'm also infinitely, you know, at a distance. The, yeah. the brain doesn't like it because we like to find patterns, you know? And yes. that's why I kind of play those games with myself of like, how am I not myself or whatever else? Because anytime I catch my brain wanting to catch a pattern, it feels like I, I'm, I'm a, my ego's attempting to pull me out a little bit, which isn't mm -hmm. terrible. Like I'm not, I'm not mo like making the ego a monster. I've learned to become friends with the ego, you know? And I just mm -hmm. remind it, you know, Oh, but this isn't necessarily truth or this isn't mm -hmm. necessarily reality. And mm -hmm. so then I allow myself to kind of break that pattern because there's so many things that we logically it don't make any sense on a mm -hmm. logical level. Yeah. <laughs> when you described the, the, the sort of infinite distance and no distance, that's exactly how I would say I experience it. I'm not experiencing it, but the, the, what you might call the lamp over to my left or what you might call the wall up into my right. And what I might call the computer screen in front of me, they're not, separate things they don't they don't exist as substances of any kind they have no apps they have no specific location and so they're in all locations they're literally in all locations in this sense field and there's no center to it and they're also there's also no location here at all there's no distance and no space at all here which is again paradoxical but i think the mind says this or that reality says this and that yeah. It is simultaneously literally nowhere at all, which doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist. It's just that it doesn't exist as something discrete in one place. Right. And at the same time, it's literally everywhere and everything at the same time. And I guess that's why I say I don't exist because I'm not saying that I completely don't exist. I just don't exist the way that I used to think that I existed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, yeah. this is something, <laughs> you know? There's some, there's some, some appearance here, of, of some, some sort. Yeah. Yeah. But I also have gotten this feeling that this has happened before. Like we've mm -hmm. been here. We've done this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's like a dance. And I'm, then I, then I have this distinct feeling that, you know, the, the whole river flow of time is also kind of a construct of my mind and Whenever mm -hmm. I'm allowing myself to kind of shut that off or, or quiet it, I start to feel like there, there's, oh man, that, that sense of reality is such an intense rush at first that it feels almost overwhelming, you know, that, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know how to, like you're saying, there's no, there's no particular grid form of location and time, but time space at, as as my experience is not even on an intellectual level it's so intensely vast that it's like this ocean of experience that's just flooding toward us at all times you know mm -hmm. and we can choose to entertain it or we can you know somehow i don't know it might even be a gift to be able to block it out like we do as human beings mm -hmm you know, to like experience it in, in bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, separate streams uh, of experience that allow yeah. us to function because it, cause like, you wouldn't, I don't lot. think I would wish this on a small child. Like Ugh. I think kids with <laughs> autism and, and those sorts of things actually do experience some of the senses this way. And it's, that makes it very challenging for them to develop a discrete ego self sense of self. And 
Um, but yeah. at some point, it, once I guess we, we balance it all out, it, it actually can work. I thought of this analogy when you were speaking and referencing back to what you mentioned earlier about um, the bodygasm. It, it, feel, it feels almost like a, when you see the capacity of this, of the, maybe the body mind or maybe just the environment or body mind environment, whatever this is, when you, see, when you actually realize the capacity of it for energy to move through, it's, it's really incredible. I think of it almost like, or in this moment, uh, like a, if you think of a raging river of energy and somehow we develop this little tiny stream that comes off the river, goes out off onto the side and does its own thing and then comes back into the river. That's like human self-reflective consciousness. And it's, it doesn't really, it kind of wants to go back to the river. It knows, it, it knows it's always been that river, but it also knows when it goes to that river, it's going to be completely destroyed. It's going to be absorbed into it, right. which is simultaneously a, a, a waking acid trip that never ends and also sort of like amazing and, and completely indescribable and potentially terrifying <laughs> until, until you adjust to it and realize all there is is the river and that river is not in time and it's not in space and it's all, all possibilities simultaneously. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that kind of goes back to that feeling of dying is that was me jumping into that river. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like. Like I'm going to lose all of what I am in this process. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead I was kind of given, I don't know, granted, I don't know. Um, I just gave myself access to something that I had been ignoring is how I see it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it can be that simple as we were just ignoring it. We were looking the wrong direction. Totally. And looking harder and harder in the wrong direction. It's like, somehow it's like we're all head. antenna, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. we're, we can choose to, we're like a radio. What, what station are you tuned into? You know? And that's what I mean is like, I think in the past we feel kind of subject to it, uh, to like whatever our experience is. And we don't have anything other than this experience, which is the paradox of control because it's also thinking that, you know, oh, we can change it, but it's more like allowing versus forcing something into action. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that uh, I thought to bring up was I've always known about this aspect meaning I've always felt it it comes into play when it comes into play but I don't talk about it directly too often because because of its nature and it has to do with play it's the the archetype of the of the jester or the archetype of the trickster, how much it actually plays into this that we're talking about. Um, if anything, awakening is a rug pull. You know, you have to have the rug pulled out from under you. You just have to. Identity has to be disrupted one way or another. It just has mm -hmm. to. Maybe that happens through practice and exhaustion. Maybe it happens through surrender. Maybe it happens through tragedy. Uh, it doesn't matter how it happens, but there's a jester energy in all of this. There's something that just wants to blow up in your face. Um, and it's a close uh, relative to death, actually, to, to death. You know, All these things are just archetypes and energies I can pull out, but they're not anything different. But I, I have this um, love for that. I have this love for the, the whimsical nature of everything, life, nature itself. Um, simplicity, innocence, and yet this really profound intelligence is, is there somehow. Not, not human intelligence, though, um, in, that, in that jester archetype or that trickster. Um, Joseph Campbell has some cool th things he says about it in an interview and so forth, but it has to sneak up on you in a way. Um, Price yeah. said that King of Heaven is like it. a thief that sneaks in in the night. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I think some people when encountering a jester triggers a lot of frustration, you know, and that brings about some kind of shift. 
and like you said, sometimes it's through exhaustion. I, I've seen that. Tragedy, I've seen it that way too. But ultimately, I think the underlying message is that it's not that big of a deal. You know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth laughing about. And, you know, and Shakespeare had a sense of that too. I mean, the wisest character in any of his plays was the fool. Mm. You know, and it, I think it's because the fool got to remain untethered. Didn't have mm -hmm. to play the game that everybody else was playing. And for that yeah. reason, got to see reality in an entirely fresh way. Mm -hmm. You know, the fool often would also foreshadow a lot of events. Sometimes death. Yeah. Yet, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, it was all in good fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember clearly, uh, I may have told you this at some point, but um, you know, a few days after Awakening for me, I remember driving around and seeing a bumper sticker that said, what if the hokey pokey really is what it's all about? Yeah. And I, I just couldn't stop laughing at it. I just, it would just echo, the laughter still echoes in my, in my mind. It's so perfect. It was so perfect. The timing of it, everything. It still works. It's just know? there waiting. Yeah, it does. It really does. And it's, um, I don't even know if you can be ready for the rug to be pulled out, but. Um, no, I, mm. I think being ready <laughs> is, it, it gets in the way, right? So I think, sure. I, I, I'll just say I got lucky I'm, and I don't, I'm okay with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. showing up and having no expectations. You're right. There was things that led to that. And it just happened for me. It's, I didn't prepare mm -hmm. myself for it. I didn't say, okay, by having no expectations, it's going to be this way. Cause that's still setting up another expectation. It was like just mm -hmm. truly allowing yeah. it to be what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that is kind of a, it kind of messes with the mind a little bit because how do you just allow things to be what they are? <laughs> if you don't know, then yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the people that are interested in, in people that are watching this exact video and, and the, the other videos in your series, I think the curiosity is a really good place to start. Because it's that means you've seen some glimpses. You, you know, you know it's there. You know, and you're just kind of knocking on the door a little bit. Just don't take it so seriously. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. how Rumi had the quote about, "I was knocking on the door. I had to have answers. I was knocking with, like, to the brink of insanity." And finally the door opened and I was on the inside. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. What would you say, uh, maybe as we kind of round up, round out here, what would you say to somebody uh, watching this who, you already said one of the questions I would have asked, but uh, the other one would be someone who's just really, really suffering. And they, they, they sense something in what we're talking about, but they're just, just miserable, suffering, has been their companion this entire life. What what might you say to them or advice might you give? Um, there, there's two ways that I would answer that. Obviously, the first thing that I would like to say is everything is already okay. But my relationship with my suffering in my past has actually turned out to be a gift for me to get to where I am now because I became so intimate with what that pain was like that I was finally done with it at a certain point. I finally didn't need to entertain it any longer. So I guess the, there was a point where I asked myself the question, do I, do I want this to continue this feeling, this experience or, um, you know, do I want to just allow things to be the way they truly are? Because my suffering was definitely a lot of resistance, you know. And I guess it could be the same thing with, you know, death of a family member. If you're in a lot of a res resistance, that can be a lot of suffering there. But mm -hmm. 
if you embrace it, it can be very beautiful. And that kind of sounds like your experience with your dad. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a really good, good point. The suffering can be your friend, but you don't have to, if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like how you said, ask yourself honestly, like, are you, are you done with this? Are you maybe not done with it, but have you come to a place where I might just reword it? Like, are you, have you come to a place where you've, you're trying, you're willing to try something so radical, um, that you'll let go of resisting suffering. That's a radical act. If you, if you're suffering, let go of resisting it. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to look at your competing agendas. Like you, you might, if you're really honest, you might really want to stop suffering, but you also want to be in control. And those two things just don't go together very well. You might want to end your suffering in the way you want to end it. And, and you have an idea about that. That might not even be fully conscious. It might just be an assumption that's in the background. That's like the thorn, you know, that, that keeps getting your attention. But, you know, with, with enough honesty, congruence about, about it, suffering is the best pointer, the best guru there is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, would you rather be right or would you rather experience joy? I discovered Mm -hmm. I wanted to be right a lot in my suffering. It's something that I could predict with like clockwork. This is going to happen to me. And when it did, there was like some justification happening internally. But I also didn't really enjoy the suffering. But now looking Mm -hmm. back, that suffering has become a friend. You know? Yeah. And every tragedy I've ever experienced is now suddenly hilarious. It's like, you know how you laugh after, oh, we're going to laugh about this someday. You can choose to laugh about it right now. Mm. But it's not in the way that you think. You can't force it or control it, but it's more of an allowance. Just getting really Mm -hmm. vulnerable with it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. (laughs) Well, I appreciate your time. It was really good finally doing this. I think, um, well, I know people are going to get a lot out of it, so... Yeah. Um, So I do appreciate that. And let's try to stay in touch. Absolutely. (laughs) All right. Thanks for your time. Thanks, man.